Good morning. Good to have you with us again this morning. We're thankful that you can join with us. I am enjoying the book of Revelation. It's hard to believe we're moving towards the end of it already. Last week we were in chapter 19. That's where we pick up. We're going to be in chapter 20 this week. We are looking at the Millennial Kingdom. We're going to take time and just see what that's all about, why it's significant for us even right now. I want to know what it means to me right now as I serve the Lord. It's significant, all revelation is. And so my prayer always is, is that the Word of God, even as we're looking ahead to the future, will touch your life as you're living for the Lord right now. And it will, it will give you a perspective that helps you to follow the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. And it'll help you to love your neighbor especially in view of eternity and their need for Christ. So last week we focused on the second coming of Jesus Christ. What's, what's the result of that? Well, that's what we're going to see today. Matthew chapter 25 puts it this way. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. That's what we see taking place. It's the second coming leading to this moment, which is the beginning of the millennial kingdom, the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. We will be with him here as well as he returns. We saw that. Not, not only the angels, but his church as well. We will be with him. He will reign as he promised. Behold, the days are coming. We see in Jeremiah, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He shall reign as king and he will deal wisely. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will be dwelt securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. His righteousness will be a stamp upon his kingdom. We're going to see that as we look at the Word of God together. We're in chapter 20 today, verses 1 through 7. So let's look at those together, read those. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. And a great chain, and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who was the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the pit, and he shut it, and he sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. And that he must be released for a little while. And then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years, and the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection, and blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, and they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, and we're going to see that in a couple weeks to come. What's key here as we look at this passage is six different times, we seven different times, we see the term 1,000 years. Um, very specifically, in, in this chapter, in this passage, so the question is, how do we deal with this description of a thousand years? How do we interpret this? Uh, how do we handle this? Uh, when you come to Revelation, you know, I know. There are so many approaches, so many interpretations, so many opinions on what Revelation is all about. They basically break, break down into very uh, very specific camps, Very only just a few thoughts that impact all the varieties that come out of Revelation. And so that gets back to what we call herm hermeneutics how we interpret the Word of God, how we interpret the Bible. I believe, we believe here at Emmanuel, that the Bible, how we interpret, is based on these things right here. It's, it's a literal, it's historical, it's, it's grammatical, it's contextual. It's very important that we understand that. And so what does that mean? We believe in a literal approach to the Word of God. That's simply the plain sense of the Word of God. What does the Word of God mean in its plain sense? Um, you know, when you have... Uh, when you have your mom, your child, and your mom calls you in for dinner, she may say it once, she may say it twice, she may say it three times. The third time is going to sound different than the first. When you hear it that third time, get in here, it's time to eat, you know what she's talking about. You know that what she's conveying, well, it's not a joke, hey, let's sit down and laugh. And The Word of God is filled with different genres. It's written in different ways, different styles. 
And so we look at that style, understand that it's unique, and interpret with that style in mind. That's really important. And so we simply look at the Word of God. The Word of God uses symbolism, but see, we understand that. When the Word of God uses symbolism, it usually explains the meaning of that symbolism as well, which is really important. And so we come at it and understand uh, what did God say He meant to say. As He wrote it, He meant to say it that way. It's very important. And uh, so that's how we approach the Word of God. We take it at face value. We take God at His Word as to what He wrote. We, we uh, look at it historically. What is, the, what is the culture? What's the impact of that culture on the text? The times? What's going on in the times? The history of the moment of the time? The people? Those are all very important. There are cultural elements that are significant. Uh, the grammar, what do the original languages have to say? What is their significance on the meaning of a word, a phrase, a context, whatever that might be? The context, not only of the words around it, the passage around it, but the, but the context as to all these other things that, are, that we just saw. And, and the author, as he's writing, what is it that the author intends to convey? What's, what's the meaning that, that the author intends for the audience to understand and to receive? We can never interpret the Word of God without first understanding that. And so these are, these are elements that are significant, they are important, and, and they, they lead uh, me and anyone who follows us to, to a, an arena of conclusion when it comes to the Word of God and here at Revelation. So we have a thousand years, seven different times. And I'm millennials to look at that term and say, uh, it's, it's not a literal thousand years, it's happening right now this kingdom whatever it is that's happening right now it's figurative it's it's symbolic it's it's spiritual in nature uh it's it's an understanding from an alma, his point of view that that uh satan is is bound if he's bound there's a lot of evil going on right now that's under his control and that christ is reigning right now this is this is his time and then he'll bring us together and everything will be perfect um very sim very much use of symbolism and not taking uh, these terms at face value, spiritualizing the terms into something else. But God clearly seems to indicate here by the significant amount of the placement of this word and concept of a thousand years, and as we've already seen in Revelation context, doesn't allow us to symbolize the meaning and move it away from that. Postmillennialism says that Christ will return afterward, that the church now is is in a golden age that what that's what post millennium teaches and and ultimately that the majority of the world will be saved will be converted to christianity before christ returns christ is then going to come uh there and so the millennium is of man's doing it is a man bringing uh that conversion about of course under the guidance of the holy spirit they would say but it's man that does that not christ ruling and reigning it's not a literal thousand years there it is spiritual and it's conceptual in that sense um, and then, and then there's the idea of premillennialism, and that's just simply taking God at His word and saying this is a literal 1,000 years that begins and is completed under the reign and rule of Christ. That's where we come from. We could say a lot more. We have as we've been in Revelation. Let's talk about what happens prior to the beginning of this kingdom. Uh, and I want to go back to something that I said last week as we were in chapter 19, verse 21. And it says, and after, after God came down here, it says in verse 19, uh, the Antichrist, the beast, they are captured, they are taken, they are thrown into the lake of fire. And then in verse 19 it says, and the rest were slain by the sword. They came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds gorged with their flesh. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a supper of condemnation, it's a supper of judgment, and, and God brings all the birds of prey to eat on the flesh of those that he destroys. And I, and I said maybe here last week, I know I did in the service, that the rest that are, that are slain here are the rest of the unbelievers in the world. Well, as I've been studying and just looking at that, it's true that no unbelievers will go into the millennial kingdom, but, and it's, that's a truth. But a truth spoken too soon uh, on my part. Uh, the rest here, I believe, are, are those armies that have come with the Antichrist to destroy Israel and... Um, and so we have, I believe here, unbelievers still alive when Jesus Christ slaughters these armies, wipes out these armies, the birds gather to eat the flesh of these armies that have been destroyed. But I believe that there are still unbelievers on the earth at the moment that Jesus Christ returns after chapter 19, verse 21, and I'll explain why that that's true. 
And there's a context here too. There's a context for when Jesus Christ comes and there's, there's something significant that's about to take place. And Zechariah doesn't talk about this event, but it gives us context for this event. Zechariah tells us this in chapter 14. And then the Lord my God will come. That's the second coming. And all the holy ones with him. And on that day there will be no light, cold, or frost. And there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. God's going to extend the day in a supernatural way, this day that he returns on the second coming. He's done this before for Israel in the past. He certainly is capable of, of, uh, of producing a miracle such as this. And when he comes, there, there will be an event that takes place prior to the millennial kingdom unfolding. And that's what I want to look at right here. It's significant. It's important. It's, it's what we see in, in Matthew chapter 25. It's the sheep and the goats. Okay? Really significant. This is Matthew chapter 25. Uh, this is connected directly to the second coming. You have the, you have the judgment of the sheep, sheep and the goats, and you have the great white throne. I believe that they are distinct. We'll talk about that more when we get to the great white throne. Distinct judgments. Um, Matthew 25, 31 says this, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, that's the second coming, and all of the angels with Him, then He will sit on his glorious throne. When he comes, he will he will stand on the Mount of Olives. Uh, he will fight for Israel. Uh, he will bring about a, a topographical change in Israel and around the earth. And then he will sit on his glorious throne. And there will be a separation of humanity that takes place. Matthew 25, before him will be gathered all the nations. And I believe these are living people who come out of the tribulation, believers and unbelievers. And that's why I've adjusted a little bit what I said from last week, because the rest in chapter 19, verse 21, seems to be the armies, not, not the entirety of the whole world. Because the unbelievers, then, who are still alive, come into and before the Lord in this moment. And um, so the Lord gathers all the nations, believer, unbeliever, and he separates them. There's no need to separate them if he's already slaughtered all the unbelievers. We'll see that in a second as to why that's true. So you're going to separate believer and unbeliever, the nations, one from another, as a sheep separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. There's going to be a distinction he's going to be made. It will be eternal. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And it will be based upon how they have treated the brethren, which indicates their heart. We see that as actually in verse 40 of this chapter. Then he will say to those on his left, living unbelievers who survived the tribulation, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And so we have these living unbelievers who have survived the tribulation, not the armies that were destroyed, but the rest of the world that, that has watched, observed, and seen the second coming of Christ, who then now stands with accountability before Jesus Christ at the separation of the sheep and the goats. Jesus is on his throne. He separates the peoples, the living peoples, the flesh and blood, who are alive at the end of the tribulation, and he makes a distinction. And he says to those who are believers and in Christ, you are blessed. Come into, come into the millennial kingdom. Come into life with me. The kingdom has been prepared for you. It's pretty exciting. It's most exciting. It's, it's, that's salvation, folks. There's nothing, great, there's nothing greater than that. Whether it's someone you love or someone that you meet that you lead to Christ. That moment then, that moment here, it's, it's never any greater than that. That's what's happening here. It is the result of salvation. And those who have denied Christ during the tribulation have hardened their hearts it would not give God glory. It would not repent over and over again when they were given chance. But they survived the tribulation. Now they are separated from Christ and they were thrown into hell. That's here at the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Chapter five, or Verse 5 and 6 of chapter 20, which we read, the rest of the dead. See, now we have all those who were slaughtered, um, all those who have died prior to this uh, in history past, and all of history that are unbelievers, do not come to life. There is no life 
resurrection for unbelievers at this moment, at this time. Now, you need to understand that and see that that's clear. This is the first resurrection. There is a resurrection that takes place right here, right now, when Jesus Christ returns. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in this, this resurrection, this first resurrection, over such the second death has no power. That's the great white throne judgment. That's for all unbelievers. They will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Um, so this is a prelude just prior to the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So who's going to be in the millennial kingdom? That's the question, right? Uh, I believe the church is going to be there. Scriptures are clear on that, right? We see that. Revelation 19, we see the Jesus Christ returns. The marriage of the Lamb has taken place, and his bride, the church, has made herself ready. And the armies of heaven are arrayed in, in fine linen, white and pure. We, are we, the church of Christ, we are following him on white horses. You have the tribulation saints, the tribulation martyrs, who are also brought into the millennial kingdom, verse 4 of chapter 20. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, for the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, and they came to life. We've already seen them over and over again at the altar, at the temple before before. Christ. A God, and during the tribulation, as they've been executed, they've gone directly into the presence of God. Now, now their souls are are reunited with incorruptible bodies. First Corinthians fifteen. They are resurrected to to new bodies. They live in the now are able to experience the millennial kingdom with the church. You have Old Testament saints as well, who who are. I believe, experience now this resurrection as well. These are believers from the Old Testament, from before the church age, who received Jesus Christ. It's also those in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, before the church is instituted. Isaiah 26, 9, Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is the dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. That's the resurrection here resurrection of life for believers we have in ezekiel chapter 37 we have the valley of the dry bones thus says the lord god behold i will open your graves all of israel who love the lord and raise you from your graves O my people i will bring you into the land of israel and you shall know that i am the lord when i open your graves and raise you from your graves O my people i will put my spirit within you and you shall live and i will place you in your own land and then you shall know that I am the Lord, and I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. I love this. Over and over again, I simply see this. God giving promises to Israel that have not yet been fulfilled and are being fulfilled now here during the Millennial Kingdom. I believe there's no other way to see that. I don't believe at all that Israel has lost her place of blessing before God. I believe God will keep his every promise to her. Those promises have not been completed have not been fulfilled, but they will be. And this is very much a beautiful piece of that right here. And then again, as we've seen, those who are who are believing, who are tribulation survivors, who have who have survived, who were not executed for their faith during the tribulation, the king will say, as at the sheep and the goats, blessed come, those who are on his right, you come, blessed are you. You can inherit the kingdom of God. Those are living tribulation believers who survived the seven years of the judgment of God against this world and of the wrath of the Antichrist, the prophet, Satan himself, the false prophet, and Satan himself. So the millennial kingdom uh, will be filled with all believers of all time. I believe at this point, every believer who has ever lived, Old Testament and New Testament, is now resurrected here at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we go into that kingdom together. Living believers from the tribulation go into the tribulation as well. We're going to talk about that. We're going to see that. Uh, they, those believers, not the Old Testament saints who are resurrected to a new body, not the martyrs who are resurrected to, the, to a new body, not the church who has been resurrected to new bodies, but these living believers who survived, who still have flesh and blood, but our, but our genuine believers, they will repopulate the earth. They will be the ones who will continue to have 
marry, to have children uh, in perfect, almost perfect conditions, and the world will, will, the population will explode, and the earth will be filled with people more than now, probably. It will start from these who come out of the great tribulation who have survived because they are genuine followers of Jesus Christ. What's the purposes of the, of the millennial kingdom? Well, there's a few. There's a lot we could mention. Let's mention a few. One is simply Christ. is to fulfill the word of God. is to show the fulfillment of the word of God, the, the prophetic word of God being fulfilled in Christ. That's so important. Luke chapter 1, we see this. Jesus, this Messiah, the Son of Man, He will be called great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to Him the throne of His father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of His kingdom there will be no end. The prophecy of Jesus Christ, born in a manger, and yet going back to the Old Testament, fulfilling the promises made to David, how significant that is. He will rule Forever, Jesus will rule forever. When he's picking up that mantle as he begins this millennial reign, he will rule, he will govern in righteousness of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end on the throne of David over his kingdom. He will establish it. He will uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forever more. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Everything in his kingdom will be right and righteous. He will be worshipped. He will be served. May all kings fall down before him. May all nations serve him. We could go to many places for all of these. I'm just giving you a taste. I'm just giving you a glimpse. I'm just showing you the word of God. He's, he will be honored and glorified above all the earth, above everyone else. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planning, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. He is fulfilling his word, every word, and doing so, and not only to Israel. The millennial kingdom is, is very Israel focused, and yet the church is there, and the tribulation martyrs are there, and the living saints are there, and we are ruling and reigning together, and we are doing all these things, but Jesus Christ, above all, is being glorified. He is being honored. He is ruling. He is reigning. This world under the reign of Jesus Christ, is nothing like the world that we know now. Everything in this world right now, it reflects the one who, who has control under the sovereignty of God. Uh, it is Satan. Satan. Satan has his hands in everything that this world is doing, and it's reflected in everything that this world does. When Jesus Christ rules and reigns, everything in this world, it will reflect him. The way cities government and, and states government and countries government, govern and, and the way everything functions. And there will be no Hollywood that, that, that pours out and produces just filth and wickedness and junk and all of that. That's all going to be on the wayside. And everything will be reflective of Jesus Christ, his values, his worldview. The world will be completely different. It will be under Christ. Not only will Christ be preeminent, which is the number one thing, which is the most important thing, which makes heaven heaven. It makes his millennial kingdom the millennial kingdom. It's all about Christ. It's not a, It's not about a nation. It's not about any believer. It's about Christ, and that's what comes out. It is also uh, the millennial kingdom is to honor the word of God, to show how the word of God is being fulfilled in, in its word, its promises to Israel. It's so important that we see this. In Genesis 12, we see God call Abraham to, a, to a, a land he doesn't know, but it's a land that the Word of God is going to show us. Uh, he will be a blessing. Israel will be a blessing to the whole world. It has in bits and pieces somewhat under Solomon, right? But not like this, not like what God promises. We see in, in Deuteronomy 30, blessing and curses. And it says here, you, when you return to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, then your Lord your God will restore. He will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. And that's, that's more than just God gathering Israel in 1947 and making her a nation. That's prophetic, and God is doing that and did that. But it's more than that here. Notice how important it is. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you. Um, and so God is gathering those who have gone before them, 
who are now in heaven, been resurrected, and he will, they will gather those who were, who were in heaven during the tribulation, who were executed, who were Jews. God is now bringing them back together to earth. You're like, well, they're leaving heaven to come to earth. But you know what? What is heaven? It's where God is. Where will Christ be during the millennial kingdom? He will be on earth. And they will come back and they will be in the very presence of Christ as they were in heaven. And God will gather all of Israel, not just those who are living here. And the gathering here is not just a national gathering. It is a spiritual gathering. It is, it is God's people being holy once again, being right with God as a nation. Israel's together as a nation right now as we speak. But they are not holy before God. They are not righteous before, before God. Israel today has not embraced Jesus Christ as Savior. This passage talks about that day when it happens. And Scripture does over and over again. It's not just a literal gathering, which has taken place, but it is a greater gathering. It is a spiritual gathering. It is a holistic gathering that is yet to take place and be fulfilled. He's promised Israel a king. Go and tell David, this is a Davidic covenant, when your days are fulfilled, when you die and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, David, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. There will be one who comes after David, who ultimately is greater than David, one who was before David, who is the root of David, but now comes after David. We could go to all these passages. That's Jesus Christ. And he is fulfilling that. Israel is, will be given what she has always been promised, a king from the line of David, physically from the line of David, spiritually from the line of David, and will be king. That's Jesus Christ. One of the purposes of the millennial kingdom is simply to create a, a holy environment. We see that here. In the passage that we're in today, Revelation chapter 20, we see in the first three verses what happens. Angel, an angel comes down from heaven with the key to the, the bottomless pit. Uh, he seizes the dragon, who was that ancient serpent. He was there in Genesis. He deceived Adam and in Eve. He, he goes back. He is the author of the beginning of sin. He is the devil. He is Satan himself. He knows all these titles are used for just the wickedness of who he is. And he is bound. He, there, he is bound by a chain. Well, spirit beings can't be bound. Angels can't be bound. Really? Because the Word tells us he is. The Lord is able to do anything that he chooses to do. He's able to accomplish his will. He binds Satan with a chain that is able to bind Satan. Satan, and he throws him into the pit. And not only that, he shuts that pit. And not only that, he seals that pit over him. And I believe here, not only is Satan thrown into this pit, I believe all demons are thrown into this pit with him. It doesn't tell us that. But at the same time, we can assume that that's what takes place because of the nature, because of what's told about the millennial kingdom under the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ that he might not deceive the nations any longer. There will be no spiritual deception from Satan and his forces during the millennial kingdom until the thousand years are coming to an end, are ended, that he must be released for a little while. He released, his forces with him again released. I believe Jesus Christ, he is ruling and reigning he will never rule and reign and allow sin to have sway, to have influence over his kingdom and his people. It is a holy kingdom. Now, the eternal kingdom will be a perfect kingdom. The millennial kingdom is not yet a perfect kingdom. We're going to see why that's, that's true. Satan's bound, folks. He's bound. He cannot deceive. He cannot empower. He cannot influence politicians. He cannot influence Hollywood. He cannot influence you or me. He cannot influence during the Millennial Kingdom or his forces, his minions. They cannot do that. I believe that's exactly what's being communicated here. He will be bound. His influence will be bound. There will be no deception that takes place, which makes what we're about to see even more significant more amazing, that's what we're going to see. I think another purpose of, of the Millennial Kingdom, because the question is why, 
why does Jesus Christ rule and reign for a thousand years and then, and then have another judgment and then go into all eternity? Why are these things necessary? What's taking place? I believe, as we mentioned here, a significant part of that is Jesus Christ is being true to his word. He is honoring his word that he has laid before our hearts. That a, that a Messiah would come, a deliverer would come, a king would come, king of kings and lord of lords, that he would rule and reign. Here, seven times in Revelation, a thousand years. It's not a typo. It's not, it's not God. It's not Jesus saying, you know what? I should have been more clear on that. How can I say that better? If it's symbolism, folks, why didn't Jesus Christ show that symbolism with clarity to us. See, the context of the passage, the context of Revelation, clearly indicate that when Jesus is communicating here, he is plainly telling us this is a thousand-year reign. Satan will be bound for a specific period of time. Which leads us here, this reality leads us to really an astonishing reality that will still be true and has always been true and is and is. One of the purposes for which the millennial kingdom is here, and think about this, Jesus Christ, God, Jesus, everything was, was created through Christ. He creates heavens and the earth. He creates the heavens and the earth in six days, and he creates Adam and Eve on the sixth day. And he creates them sinless. He creates them perfect, but with the ability to choose. And ultimately, they chose to sin against God. God. And that curse, the impact of that's been on us forever since then. Jesus Christ came to the cross. He paid the penalty. He purchased back the deed to this earth. It was lost because of sin. He wrenched it back from Satan's hands. It's in his hands right now and in full power and authority. He will rule and reign here and then with all victory after the great right, great white throne. During this time, this thousand years, man will be reminded. Romans tells us that every man is without excuse when we stand before the Lord. He is taking away the last excuse that man could possibly use and is going to try to use before him when they stand before him in accountability. The, re the millennial kingdom is, is a reminder to us. It reinforces how depraved we really are. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately wicked. It is desperately sick. And who can understand it? Even under Christ, man is wicked. Now, the only ones who came from the tribulation into the millennial kingdom that were living in flesh, alive, and not with resurrected, sinless, incorruptible bodies, because all who have been resurrected with new bodies are sinless and holy, incapable of sinning i you and i who know jesus christ now we will be incapable of sinning we cannot and will not be able to sin we will not be drawn to it we will hate it it will have no power over us we will have been given the ultimate eternal power of overcomers in christ that's important to know unbelievers who are living in flesh and blood who survive the tribulation move into the tribulation they will still have to fight spiritual battles. Now, Satan will not be here to deceive. See, what's revealed now in this reality is this. When man stands before Christ, they'll not be able to say, well, it wasn't my fault. It, it, was, it was my environment. It was the people around me. I, I just didn't have a choice. I'm a victim of my environment. I'm a victim of things that have happened to me and horrible Horrific things maybe have happened to you and to people that we know and people that we love. That's why we need to be people of grace and extending the love of God to people who have hurt and have scars and pain that are deeper, folks, than you and I can, can realize sometimes. But the reality is this. Our environment doesn't shape us. It does shape us. It influences us. But we are able to rise above our environment because of Christ. Jesus Christ is going to give the world a perfect environment, as it were. Satan will have no influence, but what will be the influencers still here during the tribulation? There won't be that outflow, out, outward temptation. It will still be the temptation that starts from within the heart. My heart, all those who are born 
to these believers and families are are spread out over all of the earth and new families and new families and new families and people are being born maybe by the billions again, right? They will all have to make a choice. Where do I stand with Jesus Christ? They will they will be forced to, they will have to hide their sinfulness if they do not receive Christ because Jesus Christ will swiftly deal with sin in the millennial kingdom. But many will rise up in rebellion at the end. We'll see that. We'll get to that. Why? Because of the sin of the heart. We're dirty because we are sinners. We're inherently sinners when we are born. We're dirty. We're wicked. We're guilty. We're depraved. We're separated from Christ at birth because we're sinners already. We don't sin because of our environment. We sin because we're sinners. We don't sin because of the way people treated us. We sin because we're sinners. We react. We lash out to people the way they treat us. Absolutely. But we do that because... Inwardly, we're sinners. The heart is deceitful. Even under Christ, it will be revealed if I do not receive Jesus Christ as Savior that I am a sinner. I will stand guilty before Him. See, the key here is the world, at the end, there will be many who have lived under Christ, but they were not in Christ. They did not know Jesus Christ. They did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's important to understand. He will reveal still the sinfulness of man. He will reveal that man needs a Savior, even in the most perfect of conditions. It's only until they are saved and changed by Jesus Christ inwardly that they will have life and transformation. Outward change is not enough to take care of my sin problem. Many will be outwardly changed. Many will will conform to the righteous standards. They will go to church, as it were, but will not conform to Christ. That's going to be revealed here. What's the results? What's the realities of the Millennial Kingdom? We're going to talk about this next week. Let me just mention one, and with this we'll close. Prayer will have been answered. It's a prayer that you and I pray regularly and often, that we are called to pray, that's to be on your heart right now as you're living for Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 6. Pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This prayer will be answered in finality in the millennial kingdom. These are the very things that will take place. And he is still doing that now. We need to be praying, God, would you be hallowed in my life today? Would you be holy in my life today? God, your kingdom, what you want to take place in your kingdom, the values that you have for those who live in your kingdom, may that be happening in my life. May I share, have, and model those values in my life. Your will, the will that you have for this world, the will that you have for my life, Lord, may that be my passion today, right now, as I follow after you. This will ultimately be answered, fulfilled, completed in the millennial kingdom. And it is a prayer that we need to pray on a regular basis that we would love the Lord just like this, His name, that we would pursue living like we're in His kingdom, and that we would pursue as Jesus Christ did when He was on earth, completing, fulfilling the will of God. Thank you for coming with us. We have a lot more to learn. We're going we're gonna to do a part two next week on the Millennial Kingdom. Keep learning, keep growing, keep praying this right here. Be tender to those who need the Lord. May God use you this week. Thanks for joining with us. And we'll see you next week.